So due to, to a mix up in the schedule of the conference, I actually, this is the second time I'm giving this talk. Um, I had originally promised, promised to give this talk at the NLLGG track yesterday uh, and then signed up to give a talk, but then it turned out that I was put in the program twice. So that explains why not, not that many people have showed up, but it doesn't matter. So today I'm going to talk about something called Cloud ABI, which I've been developing for the last year or so, uh, which is available as open source software and my company that I have provides support and trainings and consulting work related to this. So um, before I'm going to explain what Cloud ABI is, let me first sort of uh, explain what I think is wrong with Unix. Uh, everyone of course has things that they think are wrong about Unix and has a different opinion, but this is sort of what I personally think is wrong with Unix and hopefully some of those things you can see them as, as well as being problematic. So in my opinion, um, Unix is really bad at doing the following three things. Namely, it doesn't stimulate you to write software that is that you can just run securely on your system. And what that exactly means, I'll explain that in a couple of minutes time. It also doesn't stimulate you to write software that is both reusable and testable. And I'll also explain what that means in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. And systems administration on Unix is still far from optimal. Um, I won't explain what I think is wrong with that right now, but at the end of the talk, I'm going to give a couple of examples of how Cloud ABI can be used. And then hopefully you might see that this sort of changes the way that systems administration is currently done. So if you look at a sort of a, um, a Unix system on which you want to run a web service, you know, it's a fairly common use case. What you have is that a web server only needs to do a, a very small number of things to actually uh, have meaning. And so first of all, it needs to deal with incoming HTTP requests. It receives GET requests, handles them, and then serves the responses over the network. Uh, it might be the case that some of the files that you try to request, you know, through URLs need to be fetched from disk. So you likely need to access a certain directory on disk containing those files that are stored. And, you know, if you have a more advanced use case where you have sort of dynamic content, uh, you might want to access a database backend or a number of database backends. So if you sort of look at how a web server is typically deployed on top of on a Linux or Unix system in general, you see that if such a web server were to be compromised, if there's an exploit in such a web server, then an attacker can do a lot of nasty things. So for example, you could create a tarball of all the world readable data on the system, not just in the web server root directory. And even though you could argue that the data is, is world readable, so there's no security concern anyway, um, you know, it, it really re relies on the fact that all file system permissions are set up correctly, which is hardly ever the case, of course. What's private to your own company is not necessarily, uh, sorry, what's public within your own company is not necessarily public to the entire world. Um, what an attacker can also do is it can just invoke the cron tab command and ex register a couple of cron job entries. And the problem with that is, even if you patch up the web server to no longer be vulnerable, an attacker could just spawn a new backdoor every hour or so. Um, there are also a couple of other set URD tools, like for example the write command that allows you to send messages to other terminals on the system. It's fairly annoying if you're just an administrator trying to sort of fix this issue, that you receive all sorts of garbage on your terminal. And even if an attacker can't sort of, uh, um, you know, do any meaningful things on the, uh, in, in, on the file system or run any programs, and it's still annoying that the attacker can use the system as part of a botnet. You can still open all sorts of TCP connections to random hosts on the internet and, you know, do sin flooding attacks just, uh, you know, by gaining access to a web server. So, you see that people have invented a couple of security mechanisms to deal with this uh, issue. And one of those things that you see typically in Linux is sort of access control based mechanisms. Right now I'm going to talk about AppArmor, which is used on Linux a lot, but it, this, this also applies to, uh, to, to other access control based mechanisms in my opinion. The problem with those approaches is that in my opinion it puts the burden of securing the application on the user and not on the person who wrote the application. So you typically see that distros, they come up with their own app engine security policies to harden an application against attacks. But the problem is that those configurations can easily get out of sync with what the user wants out of the, 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 the process. So if it's a web server, if the user wants to serve data stored in a different document root directory, then the security policy also needs to be adjusted. 
What happens in practice is that the user then restarts the web server, it doesn't work. He does a Google search and then he sees this is because AppArmor is, is, is bugging around and then the user typically doesn't know how AppArmor works. So they typically just end up disabling AppArmor because that's the easiest thing to do. Um, also the problem with AppArmor is that certain applications are require rights that are too broad to effectively limit using app armor. So uh, I mean the extreme example would be a web server, uh, sorry, a web browser. You know, every web browser has a save dialog that allows you to save attachments on disk that are, you know, you go to different to some page, you press control S. You can store those files in any place on the file system theoretically, meaning that an app armor policy has no other choice but to just grant access to the entire file system namespace. So what you see is that um, uh, in the meantime, uh, a, a different approach has been uh, developed for this uh, problem um, uh, based on, on capabilities. And one of those frameworks is called Capsicum, that's part of FreeBSD. And what happens is that um, instead of having a separate security policy, the, the sort of the, the policy that's used is integrated into the design of the application. So software developers design applications with security in mind, which I think is a, is a good thing. So how does this work in practice? If you use Capsicum, a program just starts up as if it's a regular Unix process. It can just open network sockets, it can just access any files on disks or directories. And then as soon as the web server is finished starting up and acquiring all the resources that it needs, so it has acquired a network socket for uh, you know, uh, receiving incoming network requests, it has a file descriptor to a directory containing all the, the, the files that need to be served, the process calls cap enter which basically means lock me up and throw away the keys. And from that moment on, the process can still use all the file descriptors that the, program, uh, that the process happens to have, but it can no longer just open or gain access to resources out of nothing. So calling accept on a network socket is allowed. You can accept incoming HTTP requests. You can still open files underneath directories that you had open using the open at system call. But you cannot just call open and say give me a file descriptor to this random file somewhere on disk. So this um, system is now used in a um, couple of dozen programs in FreeBSD by now uh, with great success. Um, I'm, I'm not going to mention all of these but one, uh, the most important one being in my opinion is TCP dump. Because if you think about it, TCP dump does a lot of interesting things with network traffic. It has parsers for all sorts of network protocols. If there's a single buffer overflow inside of one of those parsers, you effectively gain root rights on the system. If you just send malicious traffic uh, on the network, you can just send this traffic that, that causes this buffer overflow days in a row and just wait until some sysadmin logs in and runs TCP dump. And when that happens, you suddenly have root rights on the system because TCP dump needs to be started as root. So with Capsicum what happens is TCP dump starts up, it opens the Berkeley packet filter device that's used to capture network traffic, and then it just calls cap enter, meaning that an attacker can only read more network packets through the uh, Berkeley packet filter or write stuff over to your terminal. And those are the only two things that TCP dump can still do. So this is fairly effective. I've used um, Capsicum quite a lot uh, over the last year, year and a half, two years maybe even, and I think Capsicum is awesome and should be integrated into other operating systems as well. And the people behind Capsicum also agree with this, they're working on this, so uh, someone working for Google is also part of the Capsicum team is working on a Linux port of Capsicum that you can find on GitHub, and in the meantime he's sort of slowly trying to get it pushed into the upstream kernel, which is something I'm really looking forward to. But I've noticed that um, Capsicum also has its downsides, and the most important one being that code isn't designed to just have a lot of functionality turned off. If you call cap enter, then suddenly you have hundreds of system calls that programs call all over the place that suddenly don't work anymore. You know, for example, the, the open system call doesn't work anymore, unlink doesn't work anymore, uh, a call to socket to create anything other than a Unix socket doesn't work anymore. And software is simply not built with this in mind. And you can really see this in practice that a lot of things sort of uh, uh, break down massively. So time zone support in the FreeBSDC library doesn't work. If your program has started up and you're calling cap enter, then there's no more mechanism in place that allows you to access user share zone info and fetch time zone data. 
um, the C library interface for, uh, doesn't allow you to sort of pass in a reference to a directory that contains all the time zone information. It simply isn't there. Uh, the same holds for localization support. So as soon as you call cap enter, there's no more way you can actually create handles to different character sets and convert data across character sets. It's simply impossible to do anymore. So the, in, in, in third party libraries, I've seen things even worse. There is this crypto library, and, it won't, and I won't give you the name, but what happened is that if you're outside of capabilities mode, it tries to open dev u random or dev random and use that as its entropy source for random data. If you call cap enter, it tries to open dev u random, which fails. It tries a couple of other things, and if all those things don't work anymore, and then it uh, suddenly falls back to using the time of day and the process identifier as the sole source of entropy. You could argue that this is just bad design of those crypto libraries, but those things are only unsurfaced, uh, or they only come to the surface because we're using Capsicum. So Capsicum can make software less secure than it is right now. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm saying Capsicum might cause Heisen bugs, Mundle bugs, and Hinden bugs. I was only aware of the first uh, term, Heisen bug, but apparently Mundle bug and Hinden bug is also used uh, as a sort of a collective term for these kinds of issues. So in my opinion, Capsicum doesn't scale because as the program becomes larger and you have a lot of external libraries, how do you know which API is still safe to call? Because it might call into another function, which might, which might call into another function, which might break on Capsicum. So that's why you see it being used in FreeBSD in the base system in a lot of small utilities, where it's still easy to sort of grasp what's happening inside of the process. But that's why I sort of wonder whether it will ever be used in larger programs that use a lot of external libraries. So the second problem I, I have with Unix or that I observe in Unix is that um, it doesn't allow you to sort of run programs that you don't fully trust. Of course, we all install applications that you know come from third parties and haven't been compiled by ourselves. I mean, your distribution already you know passes or gives you software, um, uh, and you sort of have to trust that it's all secure. But in many cases, for example, if you're a hosting provider or something like that, you simply want to run code that's provided by external people. For example, PHP scripts. Or, or Ruby scripts or Python, whatever you like. And executing those scripts directly on top of a Linux system is pretty insecure because you, know, uh, you can just tra change the global state of the system quite easily. So nowadays you see sort of jails and Docker and those kinds of things becoming more popular, but still I don't trust the security of, uh, of those systems because the sort of the, the API that the kernel exposes is so incredibly big and the question is whether, you know, inside of a Docker instance, you can actually only access interfaces that are safe to use, that, that don't uh, uh, um, expose things to the process that it shouldn't know, for example. So what you typically see is that people use VMs to run untrusted programs directly. Uh, directly. For example, Amazon EC2 offers you Xen instances, and of course, those are safe to run if you don't trust them. And in my opinion, this is a sort of a bug. Why isn't Unix designed to just run these third-party ap applications directly? Wasn't the operating system designed to intend to, pri provide the uh, to provide the isolation between processes? I mean, in the old days, DOS, of course, wasn't designed to uh, provide isolation. But as far as I know, one of the, the, the concepts of Unix was that it was sort of, uh, uh, it, it, the goal was to provide isolation, which it has failed, in my opinion. So enough about security. Another thing that I dislike about Unix is that programs are hard to test and reuse. And what I mean with that, I'll sort of uh, try to explain it by looking at something completely different for a minute, namely Java. Say you would write a simple web server in Java. You would write a class web server that um, you know, uh, accepts HTTP requests and you know, does something special with it. You could, for example, implement this class like this, where um, the class has a constructor that internally creates a socket and sets a root directory to a certain variable and you know, it accepts requests on that HTTP socket and loads files underneath that directory in slash var. A lot of people will agree with me that this is not a reusable and testable piece of code. You can only run this on your system once because you can only run a single web server on port 80, of course. Um, it, it also requires you that you use the specific root directory, which is pretty bad. So instead, you should write something like this. You know, the constructor now takes two arguments, namely a port number and a root directory, and these are passed on to the TCP socket and assigned to the root directory variable. But 
still any decent Java programmer out there will know that this is still not easily testable. Namely, you have to require an actual TCP socket, a true network socket to, to send data across, and you need a true file system to simulate uh, 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 files that are being loaded from disk. So any proper Java program would write something like this, where instead of taking a, a port number uh, you know, and creating a TCP socket on your own, you take a, so a socket object. And that socket object can also be a fake networking socket. You could just inherit from the socket class and override all of the functions in there and make it behave like a, like a true networking socket, but not use any of the like, networking interfaces of the operating system. The same holds for the file system support. Instead of using a path name and letting the class open files on disk, you could just create your own file system interface that has a couple of small routines like get file contents taking a path name. And inside of your unit test, you could just create your own fake file system class that just returns some fake contents. And now you can just create this class entirely without contacting the operating system once. You can make a true unit test for this web server class, which is not possible if you use one of the former examples. Now, why am I talking about Java, not about Unix? So, so in my opinion, Java, uh, Unix programs are similar to the first two uh, pieces of Java code that I showed. Namely, it's either the case that they hard code their behavior or certain configuration attributes, and if they don't, they load it from configuration files that are stored on fixed locations on disk, and it's it's not always even possible to override the locations of those things. So you need systems like Docker, you need namespace virtualization just to run a program in the way you like. And that's really buggy in my opinion. Another thing that I think is pretty bad is that resources are required on behalf of you. So your web server configuration, you use special declarations to say, I want to run this web server on this port using this IP address. It's not as if the dependencies are injected into the program, which you see in Java. So, in my opinion, we're sort of holding a double standard, where in object-oriented programming, or like in modern programming languages, we put a huge emphasis on testing and testability, and um, in Unix, we d simply don't seem to care and sort of accept that programs just uh, uh, do all sorts of things on behalf of you that are hard to influence. So, I just want to demonstrate that it is possible to create a testable web server on Unix, but it seems that no, almost nobody does this. Instead of uh, creating a networking socket for you, this web server assumes that file descriptor zero is, a, web, is a, a networking socket that is already provided on startup. And this has two advantages, namely it is reusable. This web server is not tied to any specific networking protocol. It might use TCP, it might use SCTP, it may use IPv4, it may use IPv6. And it's also really funny, I've, I haven't written a single line of code, but this web server can actually be run concurrently. You could spawn 10 of them all using the same file descriptor of the networking socket and you automatically have a pool of processes uh, dealing with requests. And this web server is also testable because you could just use a Unix socket instead of an IPv4 or IPv6 socket. And then you can programmatically inject requests into the web server and then capture the responses back again. So this is what I think is wrong with Unix. Stuff isn't testable and isn't secure. So now I'm going to talk about Cloud ABI. Well, you, you might have guessed it. Cloud ABI is, an, is, a, is something that I've developed that sort of tries to tackle these issues. It is a Unix-like runtime environment um, uh, that is built on the principles of Capsicum, but has all the features removed that contradict with Capsicum. So that means in practice that there is, for example, um, a read call where you can read stuff from files. There is an open add call that it even allows you to open files underneath a directory if you happen to have a file descriptor, but there is no open system call that allows you to create, to, uh, sorry, to open an arbitrary file. There's also no socket call that allows you to create IPv4 or IPv6 sockets. All of those resources um, have to be provided up front. So, what can a Cloud ABI process do by default? If you would start it up, not granting it any special rights, so you would just say dot slash my program. It can allocate memory, it can create shared memory, it can create pipes, um, socket pairs, Essentially, it can create IPC mechanisms and allocate resources that are used internally. It can create threads and sub-processes. So it can actually create an entire hierarchy of sub-processes underneath and compute all sorts of interesting stuff. There are no special rights needed for that. 
But what it can't do is it can't open arbitrary paths on disk. It can't create arbitrary network sockets, and it can't communicate with any unrelated processes on the system. So it can't send a kill signal to a random daemon on the system. It doesn't matter under which user this process is started up, it simply cannot do this by design. So if you want to give this, these processes functionality, which you typically want to do, of course, is you can grant them additional file descriptors on startup. So a file descriptor to a directory, as I mentioned, means that you can access the entire subtree of the file system underneath that point. You can uh, grant it net networking sockets. And networking sockets are really interesting because on Unix, you can also pass file descriptors through networking sockets. Only Unix sockets, of course, not actual true IPv4 and IPv6 socket, uh, sockets. You wouldn't be able to just open a file locally on disk and send the file descriptor to a computer on the other side of the internet. That's simply not how Unix works. But if you have two processes that are connected through a Unix socket, you can push a file descriptor in on one side and pop it out on the other side and use it over there. So this actually allows you to implement privilege, uh, privilege separation. So. For example, if you want to write a Cloud ABI mail server that needs to deliver mail to someone's mailbox, then instead of it let, letting it open you know, the mailbox directly in someone's home directory, you could have a supervisor process that makes sure that you know, the request is actually valid. Like, is this a, you're an actual user that, we, um, uh, um, that exists on the system? And if so, it opens your mailbox file in your home directory and passes the file descriptor back. So this is really nice from a, from a privilege separation point of view. Um, and another thing that's being offered are, are so-called process descriptors, and these are handles to, to sub-processes. So for example, if you're forking, normally on Unix you um, uh, don't have like a strict handle to that sub-process. It, it's just the case that the process appears in the process table and uh, you can just send kill sick, uh, the kills, uh, run the kill system call to kill it off or whatever. But the problem is that this isn't really um, uh, uh, guided or enforced in a certain way. And with process descriptors, you can just fork your process and at the same time get like a true file descriptor that points to the process itself. And if you close the file descriptor, then the process is automatically killed. So this also ensures that you can't leave any background processes running on the system. Because if you fork, you just get a number of process descriptors, and if your own process gets terminated, then all of your sub-processes are terminated as well. It's important to mention that um, process descriptors cannot be passed through Unix, Unix sockets, of course, otherwise you would be able to circumvent that, uh, that mechanism, but that's, that's like a minor detail, it's not important for now. So what's also interesting is that file descriptors, they have permissions on them. So instead of having permissions on the file system, for example, which you normally see in Unix, the file descriptor instances themselves have permissions. And this also has interesting use cases. So for example, you could create a piece of shared memory, put data in it, and then you want to give another process on the system read-only access to this uh, piece of shared memory. Then what you can do is you can duplicate the file descriptor, so it still points to the same shared memory object underneath, but on the second file descriptor you can remove all of the write related bits. And then you can send that to another process and then the, the other process can only access the piece of shared memory for reading. So it does have a couple of very interesting use cases. So now if you want to model a web service using Cloud ABI, what you could, for example, do is uh, you could just make sure that you start up your web server process with just a couple of file descriptors, namely an already bound um, IPv4 or IPv6 socket that's you know, listening on a certain port number and accepting requests. You can give it a read-only file descriptor to a certain directory in the system, meaning that files underneath can only be open for reading, regardless of your user, regardless of file system permissions. It's always only possible to open them for reading. And you could give the process an append-only file descriptor to a log file, meaning that there's no way that process can ever truncate the log file or overwrite all their entries. So if an attacker manages to break into a web server after a log entry has been written, there's not a way for it to actually revoke that entry to, to remove it from the log file. So what's interesting about Cloud ABI is um, I've noticed that if you sort of take Unix, you know, the POSIX specification like your prototypical Unix, and you remove everything that conflicts with this model, so any access to global namespaces, you know, as I mentioned, removing open, uh, removing administrative system calls like reboot, then you end up with something that's really tiny. Um, 
FreeBSD, for example, has about 300 system calls, 350. Linux also has about 300 system calls. But for Cloud ABI, I only ended up having 58 system calls. And what's nice about such a low number of system calls is that it's fairly easy to add support for this to other operating systems. So what you could do is you could patch up Linux, FreeBSD, NetBSD, Solaris, macOS, maybe even Windows if you happen to have access to the source code. And then you can just run these Cloud ABI processes without any modification. So you compile them once and they run everywhere. So right now I have proper support for FreeBSD and uh, NetBSD, both ARM64 and x86-64, because in my opinion those are the two only sort of modern relevant hardware architectures that are you know, being used. 32-bit Intel is rapidly declining and 32-bit ARM might still be used, but you know, mainly mobile phones, not on like, servers or that kind of stuff. And there's also an experimental Linux port that still needs some more polishing up. Um, so now that I've explained what Cloud ABI is, I'm going to explain how you can develop software for Cloud ABI. And let me um, start off by saying that building software for Cloud ABI is not easy. And the main reason for this is that cross-compiling software in general is hard. You have to think of Cloud ABI as being its own separate operating system, but there is no actual operating system. You know, you, you, you're on a Linux system, but if you want to build software for Cloud API, you're building it against an operating system that does not exist. So you have to use a special cross-compiler for this, like a cross-compilation toolchain. And the problem is not that Cloud API by itself is hard to target, but cross-compilation in general is hard. There are quite a lot of uh, source packages out there that simply have a build infrastructure that doesn't make it easy to cross-compile. Autoconf-based packages are, you know, they, they do allow for some cross-compilation, but um, sometimes people use sort of unportable constructs or bad assumptions uh, uh, in their configure scripts that make it hard to cross-build. So, for example, they try to figure out the name of your random device by looking at the name of the random device on the host system and then use that to, um, you know, as part of their build process inside, inside of the binary uh, that's that's uh, being built for Cloud ABI. Well, of course, the name of the random device is just uh, something I just made up, but it doesn't make any sense on Cloud ABI because there is no global slash dev slash u random, of course, but you get the idea. Um, another thing that's pretty hard is sort of uh, uh, making sure that you get the tool chain all complete because a tool chain, cross compilation tool chain, consists of a lot of separate parts. There is a compiler, assembler, linker, then you have the standard core libraries that need to be installed. So a C library, a C runtime library, a C++ library, a C++ runtime library, and a C++ stack unwind library that's needed for exception handling. So you end up with a whole bunch of libraries that all need to be installed manually, and they all have cyclic dependencies on each other, which makes it even worse. So if you want to do this manually, getting a cross-compiler toolchain is not an easy thing. Um, Finally, what also makes developing software for Cloud ABI not so easy is that a lot of pieces of software need to be patched up in a certain way. So a good example is always a, a libpng, which builds out of the box on Cloud ABI with the exception of a couple of utility functions that they've added that allow you to sort of decode or, um, a file using a file name. So it's like decode file by file name, and then you can just use an absolute path name. Something like this doesn't work with Cloud ABI, even though the rest of the PNG library the actual decoder logic builds out of the box properly. So all those libraries they need to be slightly patched up to sort of remove those you know, unusable constructs in this environment to actually build properly. Um, and keeping track of all those patches manually is of course something that, uh, that uh, is, is something that, yeah, shouldn't, shouldn't be done. It's just a lot of work. So what I've done is I've started working on something called the Cloud ABI Ports Collection. And what this is, is this is just a sort of a source package uh, collection where I sort of have a lot of existing pieces of open source software and have build instructions for them. So for example, uh, I can show you, is there a way to, the resolution is a bit high, sorry, I'll lower it. Huh. When I gave the talk um, yesterday, um, everything was bigger, but then I was using a different projector, of course. But um, if I go to my, uh, the Cloud ABI ports collection directory, oh, this can uh, be clicked away, then you see that I have a whole bunch of packages, and then for every package, like uh, libaug is the simplest one, uh, I have a build instruction. Here, I can even enlarge it a bit, 
and it's nothing more than this. It simply says there is a package called libaug, being at version number 1.3.2. This is the official website name, and it needs to be built according to these rules. And this is like a simple build instruction that just says, extract it, run autoconf run, make, and make install. And here's some information about like the, the dist file, the checksum. And uh, so I, I have recipes for uh, like about 80 open source libraries right now. And um, these, um, what happens, Cloud ABI port builds all of these packages in a sort of very controlled environment that makes sure that the cross compiler is all set up correctly. And then it generates packages for a whole bunch of operating systems. So it generates .dep files that you can just install in your Debian system using app get. It creates FreeBSD packages that you can just install on FreeBSD using the PKG command line tool. So all you need to do is you, you just add a couple of lines to your distros or operating systems configuration, and then you can just install exactly the same cross-compiled packages on any system you like, meaning you have a, a fully consistent development environment. It doesn't matter whether you're on Linux or BSD, you can develop byte for byte exactly the same cross-compiled software. Um, it's important to mention that this collection does not contain any um, tools for the host system, for, for like Linux or for FreeBSD. Uh, the reason for this is that all these packages have exactly the same contents and they're all built on one specific system. So I'm running this on FreeBSD, for example, to generate packages. On FreeBSD, it would be really hard for me to create Debian packages for uh, Clang or for, for bin utils or something that needs to be run on Linux itself. So these should eventually be provided by your own operating system. But all of the actual Cloud ABI built libraries they're all packaged for you. So right now I already have a couple of interesting pieces of software in there. Uh, Boost, if you're into C++ programming, uh, you know, Boost provides a whole bunch of interesting libraries that you uh, uh, can use in large-scale C++ applications. Curl, if you want to use HTTP inside of your um, applications. Glib, which is sort of a general utility library used by a lot of GNOME applications or you know, piece of software coming from the GNOME project. LibreSSL, if you need crypto, it's OpenBSD's fork of OpenSSL. And Lua, if you're into some scripting. Uh, right now I'm also working on getting a couple of other scripting interpreters working like Python, for example. Uh, that would be really interesting to have. Um, so let me go out of full screen mode and go back into it again. Yes, now it works. Um, so how can you use Cloud ABI ports? Um, so here's like a couple of commands that you can run on your FreeBSD system to, to get this to work. So first of all, we want to install a compiler that we can run on FreeBSD to build Cloud ABI applications. And that's done by running uh, this command here, pkg, oh, sele selection doesn't work, pkg install Cloud ABI toolchain. And this installs a, a copy of, of Clang from FreeBSD's own ports collection. Uh, after that, we can just add, you know, update slash etc slash pkg uh, to have sort of a configuration snippet in it for Cloud ABI. And then we can install actual packages coming from Cloud ABI's repository. And an important one that you typically want to install is this one, x86-64 unknown Cloud ABI CXX runtime. The name is a bit long, but the, the names of the packages are always name of the architecture, in this case, x86-64 unknown Cloud ABI, and then the name of the actual package, CXX runtime in this case. And this installs a standard C++ runtime. And once that's done, we can just invoke the compiler to build simple applications. And that's all there's to it. So now I'm going to talk about uh, starting up Cloud ABI processes. And we'll, we'll see that, um, you know, it is fairly easy to start up Cloud ABI processes, but it doesn't give us sort of the, the results that we're interested in. And, you know, it requires some figuring out to actually make it sort of work in a nice streamlined way. So, this is a very simple Cloud ABI program that you can just write. You can just compile it and should work out of the box. Um, what it does, it re-implements the Unix LS utility. So it opens a directory um, and you know, looks at all the directory entries and then prints it to the terminal one by one. Um, it, it makes use of FD open there to open a directory handle. It makes use of FD open to sort of get a handle to the terminal, which is typically file descriptor one in, in most flavors of Unix. So running it is actually, uh, is, quite, is actually quite simple. So first of all, we just compile it using the cross compiler that we installed in our previous uh, step. Then we load up a kernel module to uh, make it possible to run Cloud ABI programs. 
which only needs to be done once, of course. Um, uh, for example, here you see KLD load Cloud ABI 64. What's nice is that Cloud ABI supports already integrated into the last development versions of FreeBSD. So there's nothing extra you need to install to actually run Cloud ABI processes. Uh, an up-to-date version of FreeBSD is just sufficient enough. And once that's done, you can just run your LS application like you'd normally do, dot slash LS. But in this specific case, we need to make sure that the directory is passed in as file descriptor zero. You know, you can see in the, in, on the previous slide, we use file descriptor zero as our directory and file descriptor one as the terminal. And now, um, you know, LS just runs and prints all of the entries in the directory to your terminal. And this is sort of a really, you know, arcane version of LS. So, even though this approach works for LS, um, it becomes fairly problematic if applications become larger and larger. So the shell doesn't allow you to create network sockets in a portable way. I think Bash has some extension that at least allows you to connect to certain hosts, but you can't bind on the network socket. Uh, you also can't create shared memory objects from the shell, message queues, all those kinds of things. And it also easily gets out of hand because think of the case where you have a web server that runs um, on five network sockets or something like that, multiple IP addresses or IPv4 and IPv6. It makes use of multiple document root directories because you're using a lot of uh, virtual hosts. And it might actually connect to a whole pool of database or redundant database backends, say, uh, you know, uh, five or so database backends. Then you need to make sure that you start up the process with like uh, dozens of file descriptors and actually have the ordering all right because you pass them in on the shell in a certain order and the program simply gets a table of those file descriptors and somehow needs to know the ordering of those file descriptors. This can only go wrong in practice. You know, every time you add a new database backend or something like that, you know, the, it might be the case that the database backends were sort of somewhere in the middle of the file scripted table, so all the other ones that come after it are pushed down. And it's very easy to make configuration mistakes. So I really don't want to advocate this, um, this model. It's simply not flexible. Also what it does, it really breaks the existing Unix paradigm where a complete service can be configured through a single configuration file. You know, the Apache configuration, you can both list the actual behavior of the web server. Like if I get something for this MIME type, I need to treat it as PHP, for example. But in addition to that, you can also use it to list IP addresses, port numbers, global path names, etc. And this is completely lost if you would use this kind of model. So what I've done is I've developed something called Cloud ABI dash run. And Cloud ABI dash run makes use of a library called lib Cloud ABI. And the name is a bit misleading, lib Cloud ABI. It's actually a library that is available for Linux, FreeBSD, free etc. You can just use it inside of your application. In a, in a native Unix application. And it, this allows you to sort of start up Cloud ABI processes in a more structured way. So what it does, it replaces traditional command line arguments with a more flexible YAML-like tree structure. And I'll sort of uh, demonstrate it to you in the next couple of slides how it works. Again, we're going to look at a simple web server. Normally you would sort of want to write a configuration file for a web server that looks a bit like this. So this is simply like a really tiny YAML configuration file for a web server. There are only a couple of configuration attributes, like the host name of the web server, that's for example printed in, uh, could be log file entries, or could be printed in error messages returned to the user. We have a concurrent connections attribute, that can, where you can specify sort of the size of the thread pool or the number of sub-processes that respond to handle requests. Uh, we have a listen attribute, and normally you would want to list sort of IP addresses and port numbers on which this web server should listen. And then underneath, a couple of attributes for file system access, namely a log file where log entries should be written to, and a root directory attribute where you sort of specify the directory that contains all of the files that need to be accessible through the web. So if you use Cloud ABI Run, the configuration file looks similar, but you sort of add a couple of more things to it. This is what, uh, uh, what becomes of the file. Um, what I've done is I've added a couple of special YAML tags. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that YAML is actually a type language and all the entries in YAML have types. I've created my own custom types, namely socket, file, and FD. And these can be used to refer to network sockets, paths on disk, and just regular file descriptors. So for this web server, instead of using like the simple YAML file that we had over here, you just add these couple of tags. And now what happens is that Cloud ABI Run knows which resources the program depends on. 
So Cloud ABI run parses this YAML file, scans over the, the contents, sees those socket tags, and replaces them by the actual network sockets that have those properties. So whenever it encounters an exclamation mark uh, socket entry, it just calls socket and, and bind and you know, sets it up correctly and then um, uh, replaces the entry in the tree by that specific file descriptor. And the same holds for exclamation mark file. So what you get is that after Cloud ABI run is finished processing this YAML configuration, you end up with this configuration, where instead of having this, the exclamation mark socket, you have the exclamation mark FD tags. And this is what's being passed onto the application. And Cloud ABI run makes sure that those file descriptors and only those file descriptors end up in the new target process. So it reunifies the way you can sort of uh, declare resources that a program depends on and uh, actually configure it. So from a programmer's point of view, what does this look like? Um, Cloud ABI programs can still use int, uh, int main, int argc, car argv, we saw that in one of the previous slides. But if you're using Cloud ABI run, you have to use an alternative entry point for your program called program underscore main. And this entry point now gets a handle to the root of your YAML tree. So uh, what you can do is you have special accessor functions, argdata get, under, uh, get star and argdata iterate star. And those can be used to iterate over maps or sequences or get values from scalars like booleans, uh, integers or strings. It is important to mention that file descriptors are completely different from integers. So they both have an integer value, but inside of this tree, they are treated as separate types. And the reason for this is that Cloud ABI run needs to know which numbers are file, descript are file descriptors and which ones aren't, because file descriptors are passed onto the new process, but regular numbers aren't. If you use the value 5 somewhere in your YAML configuration file, it doesn't mean that file descriptor 5 needs to be passed on to the new process. But if you use exclamation mark FD2, then of course file descriptor 2 needs to be passed into the new process. So what's the advantage of this approach? So if you compare to traditional Unix, um, it doesn't require a lot more effort to configure a service than uh, you know, what you currently do. There's still a single configuration file where you can just add arbitrary configuration entries, but you can also specify the resources. There is no substantial difference, so to speak. Um, what's also nice about this tool is that it is impossible to invoke the program using the f wrong layout of file descriptors, you know, mixing it up, being off by one, and you know, letting the program use the file descriptors in the wrong order. That's because the application simply needs to traverse through this arc data structure to fetch the actual underlying file descriptor. It doesn't need to care about the actual number of the file script, or it just needs to, to get its value to use later on. Also, there is no accidental leakage of file descriptors into processes anymore. It's sort of interesting to see, especially on, 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 on systems that still use traditional init systems, that a lot of services often have file descriptors open to things that they shouldn't have. So, for example, on FreeBSD, I've seen that if I would restart DH client, it might still be the case that DH client still has a file descriptor open to my terminal in the background because that's why I launched it. Such a thing is impossible with Cloud ABI Run because Cloud ABI Run guarantees that everything is closed that's unreferenced from the, uh, not referenced from the YAML configuration. It's only pushed in if you would explicitly say exclamation mark FD1 or something. Um, and YAML, of course, it's easy to generate and process. Um, um, as I mentioned, you can also use the low-level libcloud ABI to sort of start up a program, but you know, YAML, you can easily generate it from most programming languages out there that have a nice YAML library that you can use. So there's no need to sort of uh, make sure you get all of this shell escaping correctly, what you typically have if you sort of try to invoke a program from the shell using a lot of command line arguments. You can just smack it into YAML and then pass it on to Cloud ABI Run. And also, from a software developer's point of view, there's no more ne need to sort of write a configuration file parser. You know, if your program already uses YAML as a configuration file, it's just a matter of, you know, adding a couple of attributes that use custom tags, but if you're just developing your own program out of nothing, there's, you can immediately skip the part where you're writing a configuration file parser. You can just use Cloud ABI Run and then, you know, use that data in your program directly. And uh, what's also really nice is you no, longer, you no longer need to spend any time coming up with the startup code for your application to you know, create network sockets, set custom socket attributes. Maybe your specific application requires custom TCP parameters. Instead of doing all of that stuff inside of your Cloud ABI program, 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you ask your question in a minute. You can just put all of that stuff in Cloud ABI dash run. So it really sort of makes the program itself smaller. Uh, there's a question over there. Why don't you just embed your YAML file inside the so the, 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 so the, the, the problem with, um, uh, that, that's a really good question. Why don't you embed a YAML file inside of the program? So uh, it might be the case that the user wants to sort of change certain attributes. So for example, if it's a web server, um, a web server process, then of course the user wants to be able to sort of change the root directory of the web server. Um, embedding it into the process also has a couple of other disadvantages. Um, if it's the case that the program itself on startup has to sort of acquire those resources to sort of, you know, on startup it parses its own YAML file and then tries to fetch those resources, you're breaking the entire model. The idea behind Cloud ABI is that processes start up as if they're being a black box and you just make sure that you're sort of hooking them up to the environment uh, correctly before starting them up. If the YAML file is embedded into the program and the program can sort of go out and fetch those resources itself, then it's no longer possible to run any programs that you don't trust them anymore without actually first maybe taking a look at the YAML file and, and checking whether the initialization code is correct. So that's why it's separate. It's configuration file, things that you can sort of tweak yourself with some program that you know, might be a binary that you got from some kind of commercial vendor. Combine those two and then run them. That's sort of the model behind it. So. Um, ten minutes left. I'm now going to explain some use cases for Cloud ABI that I sort of uh, thought of. Um, there are hopefully a lot more than this, but um, I'll briefly describe them. So one of the things that I sort of think is sort of a really good use case for Cloud ABI already, just considering all of the tooling that there's right now, you could use this to build hardware appliances that are really secured against attacks. So at one of my previous jobs, um, I worked at a company where we built a spam filter appliance, just a one U rec server that ran a spam filter, commercial spam filter. Spam filters are quite complex pieces of software. If there's a buffer overflow somewhere in you know, some of your code, an attacker could actually send you a faulty email and then break into your spam filter appliance. But if you look at the spam filter as a whole, it's actually a very simple piece of software, namely it's a black box. On one side, on one side email comes in, and then the other side you only sort of say, yes, this is spam, or no, this is not spam. So at the larger picture, it's an easy piece of software, but the implementation is, of course, really hairy and complex. What if you would just build this entire spam filter process as a Cloud ABI process? Well, that would like, really harden the appliance quite a lot and would really reduce the attack factor of your, uh, your appliance. Uh, same holds for, for network appliances. You have complex proxying that happens, uh, you know, custom packet filtering rules, all of that stuff no longer, uh, you know, the, the problem is, you know, you can also make the same mistakes in there as uh, with the spam filter. You can now finally sort of shield that off from, uh, from, from the, uh, the system as a whole. So another interesting use case that I foresee is that Cloud ABI could be used for a higher level cluster management. So I've, I've looked into systems like um, uh, uh, Kubernetes. Has any of you ever heard of Kubernetes? It's sort of a, um, a cluster management system. You, on all of your servers you install a sort of a special daemon and they become so-called kubelets, servers that can sort of run Docker instances for you. Kubernetes is being developed by Google and also something similar to Kubernetes is, has already been used by Google for years in a row internally called under the name Borg. And this is what they use to manage their fleet internally. So they just have a hundred thousand or maybe a million servers, I don't know how many servers Google has by now. And uh, you just want to uh, run stuff on it. You don't really care on which server it's going to run. I just want to run this process on 100 servers or 1,000 servers or 10,000 servers. Just do it. That's basically what Kubernetes is. The problem with Kubernetes and Borg is that they don't um, actually know the dependencies between programs, so they can make some really stupid decisions, like let me run this database server uh, on one side of the data center and then on completely the other side of the database center across a lot of uh, links that go over switches, I'm going to run the front-end applications that use this, this database server. The nice thing about Cloud ABI is all of the dependencies of our program have to be known up front, meaning you can make a lot smarter decisions about where to schedule stuff. You can just run stuff that corresponds with each other, closer to each other geographically. Um, it also allows for smarter planning, because if you know all the dependencies, then you can simply not start up front-end jobs if you know that the back-end jobs are down anyway. So 
this sort of opens up a way sort of to do a lot more sort of smart optimizations at a larger level in clusters. And then finally, uh, one thing I've also thought about is you could come up with Cloud ABI as a service, you know, similar to Google App Engine, where you can just write a whole pile of Python code, throw it over the fence, and they run it on their infrastructure, you know, it's, uh, that it, you can access it through the web. You could come up with a sort of a system where customers can upload Cloud ABI processes that only take a very small number of file descriptors to like a network socket, a log file, etc. And then you could just create a completely managed web hosting solution around this. So those Cloud ABI processes can automatically be started up on different services, on different servers if a server goes down, or they can automatically be scaled up as um, you know, traffic increases, simply because you've designed it in such a model where it's easy for the, uh, for the provider to just move it around. And these are just a couple of the use cases I've been thinking about. So um, all of Cloud ABI is just open source, and a lot of it is available under a, a, a liberal BSD license. Uh, my company has its own GitHub page where you can just take a look at all of the sources and documentation. There's also an IRC channel in the FNet that's typically used uh, to discuss all sorts of Cloud ABI related things. And um, on my company website, there is sort of a like, more general introduction about Cloud ABI, um, uh, also some documentation available, but also sort of uh, uh, things that my company, I describe what kind of services my company offers related, uh, offers related to Cloud ABI. So, if you're interested about Cloud ABI, come talk to me uh, afterwards or ask a question now or send me an email. Um, you know, my email address is info at nuxi.nl. You're at the bottom of the slide. And uh, yeah, that's all, that's all I have to say for now. Are there any questions from the audience? <laughs>